Okay, this is the Barra spoken word on the 19th of May, 2021. And we were, um, we are still online on Zoom. And tonight we have a very special guest. All our guests are special, but this is a very special, special guest. And she will be introduced by uh, another special person. And that is uh, our own Stan Not from Cork City. Okay, Stan, can you take it away and introduce Molly? Thank you very much, Mose. Um, I think one of the things being involved in it, if, if any community, and I've been involved in a number of communities over the years between unions and football clubs and poetry communi communities, is watching somebody arrive early on and then kind of watch them blossom. And, and I don't know if I was uh, at Oveil when Molly Toomey first read, but I was certainly at Oveil when Molly Toomey was, you know, taking her first tentative steps and I was 100% certain that I was at the Winter Warmer Festival when she read at the, the closed mic which is a, a really one of the kind of bigger first steps for poets that are involved in the Ovelle community and it's lovely when you watch people develop and Molly was one of those that when she first turned up you kind of knew she had something and you're kind of thinking oh we hope she hangs around and we'll see how she develops and then you end up here four or five years later and you're introducing uh, Molly, who will give it to a short reading of her own poetry and then follow that with a workshop focused on the myth of, I'll get the pronunciations wrong, I know, but I'll give it a whack. Proserpina and Sayers. Um, and a bio that goes like this. Molly Toomey holds a BA in English Literature and MA in Creative Writing from Univ University College Cork, where she received the title of College Scholar. She has been published in Poetry Island, Banshee, The Irish Times, Cranogue, the, Sting, Ding, the Stinging Fly, and elsewhere. In 2019, she won the Porrick Column Poetry Prize, was runner-up in the Waterford Poetry Prize, and was shortlisted for the Over the Edges New Writer of the Year Award in 2018 and 2019. In 2020, she won the Waterford Poetry Prize and was featured on RTE's Arena. The same year, Ovell published her chapbook, Spoken Worlds, Southern Syllables, and she won an Arts Council Professional mm. Development Award. She was selected for, the, for Words Ireland's National Mentoring Programme in 2020, and in 2021, she won the Even Boland Mentorship Award. So I'm sure we're in for a treat. Molly, it's been an absolute pleasure watching you develop over the years, uh, and I look forward to see what you have to offer us for the rest of the evening. And off you go, my dear. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Stan. Thank you so much. Um, and Molly, Molly, sorry. Can I just ask people to mute themselves because otherwise we lose you as the, the main dish on the menu and um, <laughs> everyone's puffs <cuffs> will be <laughs> broadcast. Yeah. Okay, uh, no problem. So what I might do is just um, for myself anyway, recently when I've gone to poetry readings, I really enjoyed the fact that people have been sharing their screen because I really love to read um, poems when people are reading them. So I, I might do that if that's okay. Um, I'll just read a few poems, so and I'll just get straight into it. Um, oh, do you mind if I um, become ho um, host, Mose? Could you make me co-host, if that's okay? Perfect. Thanks very much. Um, so I will just um, share my screen. So the first poem that I'm going to read, just in keeping with um, the theme of mythology and the theme of tonight, is called Ceres. So it is based on the myth of Ceres and Proserpina. Um, and I kind of wrote this poem, you know, during the time when the Repeal the Eighth movement was going on. And I was kind of, you know, using the myth as a vehicle to explore that. Um, and then this this poem subsequently won the the Waterford Poetry Prize and it helped me to get onto RT Arena. So I owe you know a lot to this poem, and it's one that I really close hold um, closely to my heart. So I said I would start with it. So I'll just get cracking. Um, series. I was sixteen when I felt you kick, tried hangers, scalding water, the spoke of a bicycle wheel. You shrieked, toweled, wept in that tooth-marked cot with mould like a claw. I told mothers at the playground I was a sitter. Postmen that my husband would be back later. At dusk, I'd play the video of your birth in reverse. Blood and afterbirth filling me back up. 
once I left you on the steps of the church, ran back three minutes later, convinced there were bruises like berries squished under your skin. I wanted some physical thing to hate myself for. At 12, you pierced your navel with a safety pin. My fingers itched to wring your throat, but wiped that seed of blood. Now, as I got your room for drugs, I find job specs, CVs, a photo on your dresser of us on the swings, me pushing you away and pulling you back in. So that's the first form. Um, yeah. Thank you for listening. Um, so my second poem then is in keeping with myth. I said I would start with three poems that are kind of found, have their foundation in myth. So Fanula, um, my basis of Fanula was from the Children of Lear. Um, so it was actually published um, in Poetry Ireland Review, which I was really chuffed about. Um, but Clef Rice was editing at the time. So it's, it's based on the Irish myth of the Children of Lear. So Fanola's mother um, died giving birth to the twins Fiacra and Con, and Fanola's father remarries Aoife. And Aoife is portrayed as this kind of evil stepmother, um, like many stepmothers. And she curses um, Fanula and her brothers to live as swans. Uh, I took that little bit out, <laughs> which is like the main part of the myth. But anyway, um, this is in the voice of Fanula, um, the daughter in a contemporary society. And it really kind of just deals with grief, um, processing grief and that mother-daughter relationship again. So Fanula. My friends get matching piercings. Sip Smirnoff on rooftop bars while I push a double buggy, cut jam sandwiches into hearts. Maybe I shouldn't have called dad's rebound a hag, but God, how she glared at the twins, stuck a pin in Khan's bum, spat on Fiacra's rusk. I was subtle at first, Glued her Marie Claire together. Deleted photos of dad off her iPad. Put her mini on done deal. Convinced her, convinced her pasta was gluten free. But when she caught me scrubbing Fiacra's potty with her pink toothbrush, she said goodbye, good luck, I've had enough. <laughs> I didn't hear the wallop she gave the back door, the curse she hissed under her tongue. I was shut in the bathroom, pulling the last of her hair from Mam's brush. So thank you again for listening. Um, yeah. So this next poem then um, is about Cassandra. So Cassandra is a really interesting figure in Greek mythology. So she refused to sleep with the god Apollo um, after he had given her prophetic powers. And um, so he cursed her as gods do. And the curse was that nobody would believe her prophecies, um, like the boy who cried wolf or something like that. So I thought of her in relation to climate change, you know, and the you know the efforts perhaps of my friends um, in order to raise awareness about climate change in Cork City so this is based in Cork City so and it seems a bit bizarre to me that climate change could be something that people wouldn't like believe in you know so um, there's a mention of Gaia in this poem as well so Gaia would be the personification or the goddess of the earth so Cassandra at the edge of the river Lee I preach at Suits Kids, clouds of nicotine. Gannets will break their necks, diving for sardines that no longer exist. River rats will decompose by thin plastic bags. Otters will take their medicine back. Nobody remembers the grating creak of the corn creek, the howl of the wolf. Soon Gaia will unfurl her long hair burnt and brittle from chlorine peroxides 
and pick the lights that have itched her skin, crack them between each fingernail. So that poem actually came second in the Waterford Poetry Prize the year before um, series. So, you know, that's really different to, they're both different. Um, I think it's interesting. I'm glad that I didn't end up coming third then because I would feel like I was um, doing the opposite of progressing, I suppose. So coming away from mythology for um, a little bit, this poem is called um, Liz's Kitchen. Um, so it's about a topic that's quite close to my heart and one that I write a lot about, um, which is eating disorders. Um, so it's still one that kind of gets me jittery when I read it and something that gets my heart racing and everything, which I think is when you know that you're probably writing something that you should write and uh, something that you should follow and keep keep trying to write, you know, those ones that are kind of difficult to voice. Um, so what this poem about is about is using veganism as a veil for an eating disorder. So I would have had um, anorexia and I was using veganism um, as a reason to restrict. Um, and I met this woman um, in Galway and she was one of the first people to um, put me in my place really to recognize in it in me because um, she had a daughter who unfortunately was a victim of an eating disorder um, and this poem is about that experience and um, kind of about being seen you know so it's called Liz's Kitchen. So Liz's Kitchen. When did you become vegan? To avoid Battenberg on my birthday, a leg of turkey at Christmas. But I say, I can't remember what a ladybird looks like. She adds so much butter to her toast, glides the knife along her tongue, says she had a daughter like me, watched her run suicide drills with a fractured hip, found fists of her hair in the washing machine, a tooth in the sink. Here, she throws me her phone, a red ladybird like a clot of blood. So that poem was actually published in The Stinging Fly, which really meant a lot to me because I feel like sometimes it is difficult to, um, to get eating disorder poems um, seen and published and things. I feel like they're not really given voice in Irish poetry. Um, and it's something that I kind of want to explore more and um, so yeah thank you for listening to me <laughs> um so this poem again is on the same theme so this one though is, is again coming back into the mother-daughter relationship so for for me with my mother you know my mom is a really spiritual person um and we she really did bring spirituality into my life and into my recovery we both um trained as yoga teachers even but this poem is kind of about how spirituality offered a sense of hope to my mother where there was really very little to be found um you know my eating disorder really did take so much from, from us as a family even. Um, and often I think it's interesting how we kind of make our own myths, you know, how we cling to these you know, objects around us or things like that. So we get a sense of hope, um, you know, so I think even the, the myth of Ceres and Persephone is a good thing to, to cling to when you, when you need that sense of hope and renewal and things. But anyway, this poem isn't about that. <laughs> so as light, as light. When my mother finds a pale white feather, she palms her chest. Her eyelids fall like the light cotton of prayer flags in Tibet. For years, she pulled locks of my hair like dead wrens cleaving to pillows, nesting in clothes. She held worry like a worm in her throat as she handed me over to GPs, therapists, DEXA scans and ECGs. She lays the feather on the windowsill, messy and soft as the new growth at my occipital bone. Mm. Um, 
I often forget to check my pronunciation. So forgive me if I pronounce things um, incorrectly as I tend to do quite often. Um, so this poem then um, is called Massage. Um, so this is bringing in a little bit more of other people's stories. Um, so I, this was published in, in Banshee and it's about, which is a really, really good um, anthology. I definitely recommend that people purchase it. Um, so Massage is about a masseuse and she travels to a first world um, country looking for a better life for her and her sons. But the reality is bleak and unwelcoming. So it kind of explains itself. I don't really think I need to say much more. Um, massage. She switches on the CD and soaks her fingers in rapeseed oil. He removes his shirt and lays on the table. She dims the lights, applying pressure to his sacral. Her hips move to the motion of her shoulders. She closes her eyes, imagines needing dough for her two boys. Their gapped smiles runny noses. The man grunts and she is back. She moves up to his lungs and presses in like he is a bottle of ketchup. He wheezes as she compresses. She wants to squeeze until he can no longer breathe. Wants his organs to come out his lips. She will hang them in her hostel like ornaments. He slaps her thigh as if to say that's enough. And she returns to this man, the clock on the wall, the life she was told to run towards. Thank you again for your patience and for listening to me this evening. It is lovely to um, to be part of this. I really wish I was in Clonic Kilty, like, oh my God, it'd be so lovely. But anyway, um, so this next poem is called Crumbling. Um, so it's another, in keeping, most of my poems uh, are about mother, mother, daughter, mother relationships. You know, I think that's just because I've spent so much time with my poor mother um, and with women who are, who are mothers and with daughters and talking about our mothers and, and so on. Um, so yeah, well, Crumbling is about a uh, mother and her daughter. Her daughter is Anya. Um, they're struggling with homelessness. As you know, we still have a homelessness crisis in Ireland. Um, and it's about how they're treated in our country, um, where they're not only subjected to temporary accommodation, but also judged by the people who are supposed to help them. Uh, unfortunately, I do have um, the experience of being a receptionist in this situation. Um, but I'm not the receptionist in this poem, I swear to God. Um, but I do, I do, um, I have, you know, seen this situation happen. So it's it's one that one that's really horrible. Um, yeah, and I'm sorry to <laughs> to I don't know dull your evening. But anyway, crumbling. The receptionist glares at Anya's streak of snot on your sleeve. You get no welcome pack, no map of the city. Her eyes roll at your council bag of fifties. She counts them three times, swipes her counterfeit pen. Anya is dragging you now, wants her animal crackers in the bottom of the case, the case that holds your life. She is crying, stomping, shrieking. You can't sign the document, Jesus Christ. The receptionist thinks you can't handle your child. You yell at her, plead with her. She doesn't know what it's like to change a nappy on the side of the road, to eat dry rice krispies for lunch, to spit blood, because you can't afford a toothbrush. All you want is a table and chairs so Anya can dip soldiers in boiled eggs. Heat is to hang damp socks on and a shower to clean city grease off your skin. A bed with fresh linen to sleep and sleep until you can't remember the woman who held her purse 
a little tighter. The guard who kicked you off the steps of the church. This receptionist. Tut, tut, tutting. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the hard one to read. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I think this is my um, last poem that I'm going to read tonight anyway um it's called nudge it was recently published in Kernogue and i was actually blown away in the um launch of the latest Kernogue. the poets and the fiction writers there were just amazing so i do recommend looking into Kernogue or trying to be published by Kernogue. they're a fantastic journal really really supportive really great um, so then Nudge is really about a girl who's the daughter of, I should really stop explaining my poems, um, but anyway, she's a daughter of um, an alcoholic, um, but I actually think I was thinking about this today and about um, horses, so this poem is about horses and how they can offer us this real sense of, I don't know, peace and just a moment of stillness and being seen and connection. And I was thinking about how they're often in mythology, especially Irish mythology, like in Tiern and Oak, you know, um, you picture her coming in on her big white horse. And I just think that they're, you know, such such an important part of so many people's lives. And um, they can really offer, I don't know, just a sense of connection, but I suppose that's relevant for all animals. And I'll stop talking now. Um, no, okay, no, she listens to her father lug himself home. His whiskey airs a clawed, mouldering shadow coming to grip her by the throat. She stuffs her pocket with sunflower seeds, sneaks to the ragwort and yarrow, hops the barbed fence to listen to the nine-pound chant in the horse's chest. She palms her crest, his crest. His breath is nettle tea, cupped in her lungs. Later, she'll ease her father on his side to stop him choking on his tongue. Um, so that's all of my poems. Um, congratulations, you've got through uh, listening to me go on and on there about myself um, yeah so thank you very much <laughs> um, so for the next part of the evening um, I just want to first kind of talk about the myth of, um, of Ceres and Proserpina so they do have different names so different Greek and Roman names and um, just to bear in mind so that can be really confusing especially for me when I was first trying to explore myths so you've got Ceres and Proserpina and um, is I think that's the Greek names and then the Roman names are Denise and Persephone so that's really confusing so it's hard to remember so but Ceres and Denise will always be that's how I remember Ceres and Denise will always be the mother <laughs> And Persephone and Proserpina will always be the daughter. Um, so P for the daughter. Um, I'm sure there's people here though who know more about the myth than I do, like so I'm probably just absolutely embarrassing myself. Anyway, um, so what I was gonna do was just kind of read the summary of the myth and um, maybe talk about the myth. Maybe we could explore what knowledge is already here in the room. Um, we'll have a look at some paintings and then we'll go into the, the poems that have been sent out, but we'll look at them again. So um, I might just read the summary anyway. So the summary, <laughs> yeah. Hayes, the ruler of the underworld, decided that he wanted to marry Persephone, his sister Demeter's only daughter. One day as she was gathering flowers in the Nisian meadow with her maidens, she wandered apart from the group, ensnared by the sudden blooming of a glorious fragrant, fragrant flower. Some say it was Narcissus. As she reached to pluck it, the ground below her feet opened up and Hades in his four horse golden chariot appeared before her in all his power and majesty. He snatched her and took her with him to the underworld to be his wife and queen. Needless to say, Demeter wasn't very pleased when she found out from Hegate and Helios what had happened. Hurt and distraught, she started wandering aimlessly around and was aggravated to such an extent that she neglected all of her duties. And since she was the goddess of agriculture and fertility, the earth was now barren and people were dying of famine. Seeing no way out of it, Zeus, 
who some say must have approved Hate's abduction in the first place, send Hermes to the underworld to fetch Persephone back to her mother. The divine messenger did do precisely that, and Demeter and Persephone were once again reunited on Olympus. However, either on her own accord, or more probably, after being tricked by Hate, Persephone had tasted one pomegranate seed before leaving the underworld. This, according to the ancient laws, obligated her to remain in the underworld. Zeus proposed a compromise. Persephone would spend two thirds of the year with her mother and one third with her new husband. Everyone agreed. And that's how the seasons were born and how the growth of crops was explained. Just like a seed, Persephone spent a few months of the year below the earth. This is the period of Demeter's grief, which coincides with the dark winter months. However, when the time comes for Persephone to go back to her mother, Demeter brings back the light and the warmth and the earth rejoices in abundance. Okay. Um, so that's just the summary of the myth, but I am feeling that like a lot of people here, you know, um, would have more ideas, more knowledge about what, what the myth entails, you know, perhaps you have experience of reading about the myth or anything like that. So I just wonder if anyone wants to share any knowledge. Does anyone know anything about Persephone? So Ada, Miles, there, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, a little nudge there that the seed meant uh, something about marriage, actually, not just that she has to stay in the underworld, but that she sort of consents that she's married to Hades now, that mm. sort of thing. Yeah, I never thought about the aspect of marriage. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, very good. What about the rest of you? Are you familiar with the myth? Have you have you heard? I think Lauren has something to say there as well. Just that I I, I love this myth. Um, but the a really unusual part of it has gotten stuck into my mind from uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis. Um, and it's always my favorite bit, but you know, like the reason that like Hades comes up from the underworld is, you know, the giant is shaking and um, he is worried that the giant might make cracks in the earth, which will scare his ghosts. And like the line in my, uh, my translation of uh, Ovid is, you know, uh, the trembling ghosts. He's worried that, you know, it's gonna set his ghosts trembling. And there was just something about that, like whatever about the, the you know, the, the, the genderism and the sort of like stealing of women and the rest of the myth. I just thought that was so endearing that, that Hades was yeah. so worried about his ghosts getting scared. That's why yeah. he had to, you know, go up from, from the underworld. So yeah, that's kind of here nor there. But when I think of this myth, I always think of the trembling ghosts. That's so interesting. I've definitely never heard that. Is that in like a specific translation? That is in, uh, yeah, it's Mary something's translation of Ovid's Metamorphosis. It's one of the prose translations. It's not one of the poetry translations. Oh, okay. So I don't know if it's like specific to her translation, but it's like, that's the title for a book right there. You know, like the trembling ghosts. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that one is really interesting. I've never heard that take on it. Um, well, uh, anyone else have, have any experience with the myth or heard something kind of quirky and original about it that makes us look at it in a different way? I don't, I don't, okay. when I looked at it, um, at, at the original myth, it, it did strike me how, you know, the, the, it's all about f dysfunctional families in a way, you know, families eating each other, fathers killing sons, uh, Zeus that, who sort of gives her to her uncle, you know, it, mm. for the, I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to sort of apply political correctness to it, but it <laughs> makes me wonder like, wow. That those were the Greek gods, and um, what did they mean to people? That's that's what I'm. I'm, I'm just wondering. I can't say yeah. anything more about. It. And I, I think that hey, the the underworld is like our subconscious in a way. So there's a kind of relationship. Yeah. Between that. Maybe, maybe that's not an expert. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. I love that. Yeah, the underworld is our subconscious, and also I suppose so many people have used it as a way to explore things like depression. You know. Um, you know, our psyche even, you know, I think that's a really interesting take on it. Does there anyone else have anything to say about the myth? It's absolutely grand if you don't. Um, I have two kind of um, artworks that I wanted to 
have a look at just because sometimes people find um, artwork to be the thing that helps them to write. So there's just a sculpture there of the rape of Prasipina from 1621 and then the mourning of Persephone from 1906, you know, which just I think as well goes to show, you know, how long established this myth is. Um, you know, that we're still talking about it today in 2021 is, is really interesting. Um, so, yeah. Sylvia Plath wrote a poem called The Two Sisters of Persephone. I've never read that. I can't believe I've never read that. I'll have to look at that later. Thank you so much, um, Jan. That's amazing. Um, okay, so we might just go into um, looking at the poems. And one of the first poems that I wanted to look at was um, The Chord by Liana Sullivan. And I thought, what better way to do that by than by listening to Leanne herself read it um, rather than me introducing it. Um, so we might just listen now to Leanne reading the chord. So this is called The Chord. It was a poem that I wrote for my mother as a kind of tribute and apology at the same time when I was about 17. The Chord. I used to lie on the floor for hours after school with the phone cradled between my shoulder and my ear, a plate of cold rice to my left, my school books to my right. Twirling the cord between my fingers, I spoke to friends who recognized the language of our realm. Throats and lungs swollen, we talked into the heart of the night, toying with the idea of hair dye and suicide, about the boys who didn't love us, who we loved too much, the pang of the nights. Each sentence was new territory, a door someone was rushing into, the glass shattering with delirium, with knowledge and fear. My mother never complained about the phone bill, what it cost for her daughter to disappear behind a door, watching the cord stretching its muscle away from her. Perhaps she thought it was the only way she could reach me, sending me away to speak in the underworld. As long as I was speaking, she could put my ear to the tenuous earth, allow me to listen, to decipher. And these were the elements of my mother, the earthed wire, the burning cable, as if she flowed into the room with me to somehow say, Stay where I can reach you, the dim room, the dark earth. Speak of this, and when you feel removed from it, I will pull the cord and take you back towards me. Mm. So I um, love that poem. Um, I think it is really beautiful. Um, we have, I have the note. Right. Oh, sorry, my laptop is still playing. If we become separated. Uh, we have the original here, uh, just a written version of it. And I just wondered, um, just so we could have a conversation about this poem, you know, what it might have brought up for you, um, what you thought was kind of effective in it, and how you thought it perhaps engaged with the myth. But I am conscious of the fact that um, O'Sullivan wrote it um, without trying to engage with the myth. So it just, it just so happens to engage with it. So um, I wonder, did anyone have anything that they wanted to kind of say about this myth? So um, don't be afraid to just, Lauren has her hand up there if you want to say something. Sorry, that was up from earlier. I forgot to take it down. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Um, so I wonder if anyone has anything that they kind of thought about this myth. Um, so bear in mind, if you don't have anything, I might just like randomly ask people just to get you talking. <laughs> so I recognize you, Mona. Do you, do you have anything that you think about this poem? I know you know it because I know you know uh, all of this work. Um, not really. Uh, lovely to, to be here with you, Molly. Delighted. Um, not really, it, it's, it seems to be very much a teenager's poem and very much in keeping with your own writing about, you know, what you shared with us earlier. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I, I'm, apart from that, I'm 
thoroughly enjoying it. Thank you, Molly. Okay, Mona. No problem. So I think what I really love about this um, poem is the use the use of the chord, the metaphor of the chord, of the the phone the phone chord, and then you know the connection between the mother and the daughter, and then how Sullivan has kind of used the myth and brought it into a contemporary setting, you know, which I think and a domestic setting, which um only in the last few years has really become popularized in in Irish poetry. Um, you know, so I recognize you, Catherine, as well. Is there anything that kind of stood out for you in this poem? Uh, it reminds me of my own teenage years. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What kind of, you know, those kind of, yeah, those intense feelings and things like that. And yeah, yeah, for me as well. And that kind of sense of exaggeration, you know, hair dye and suicide and the boys who didn't love us, that kind of dramatic sense you know and I think you know it's, it's an interesting thing to try and tap into in your own writing and um, you know when you're young your feelings are so vivid um, and so strong you know I think it's, it's Catherine do you ever use your your you know your teenage years to write poems oh absolutely absolutely um <clears throat> I think it's I think it's a it like I always call my well I say to my own teenagers it's like it metamorphoses you know, it's like the hungry caterpillar. You just have to get through it and get to the other side. And but like, there's a wealth of information there then that you can draw yeah. on afterwards. Like, you know, that you yeah. can the cocoon, but you can still go back into the cocoon to like to just just harvest all that like angst and yeah, you know, it's it's invaluable, really. Yeah, yeah. It's totally Not that I go back to being a teenager again. Don't don't get me wrong, <laughs> but. Yeah. Um, well, but you know it, it is you know we all have to go through it and um you know it it, it it's it's kind of um it, it's a treasure treasure chest really like when you go back yeah I totally agree yeah so um, in the chat there don't be afraid to use the chat as well so um Jan was saying the ending makes me think of the biblical chord yeah and also the idea of being pulled back as a twitch upon a thread the, the GD real irony the maiden is an aspect of the triple goddess who urges us to thrive in possibility yeah that is that is really cool yeah and I absolutely agree about um the unbiblical chord she's made such a great connection I wish that I had thought of um, the phone as the phone cord, but I suppose we don't use phone cords anymore, really. Um, like the unbiblical cord, who was the myth there? Harvesting angst, yeah, as she watched um, Catherine says, yeah. I like the unbiblical cord, an act of trust. The mother allows the exploration of her daughter. It's an act of courage. Yeah, I absolutely agree. If it gets too much, I'll pull the cord back a bit. Teresa, I think you're so right. And especially that line that really stands out for me is, what it cost um for her what it cost for her daughter to disappear i think that's such um such a striking line you know i think it says so much you know it's not just the phone bill you know um, Mo says, I suddenly realised that this may not be the way of male male teenagers at all. Yeah, it's, I suppose it does really um speak to the female experience. I don't know if I can say that though. I don't know. If, you know, us males are off the hook, says me. <laughs> <laughs> interesting yeah I wonder I wonder I think I think a cool thing to do is sometimes I've done it in my own poetry is to play with the gender of these big myths you know so I have a poem called Icaria which imagines Icarus as a girl I think it's a cool thing to do it's another way to look at it so Ruth says um earthwire realization of her mother yeah and Max hi Max Max says in the 60s, no phone privacy, one in the good room, then my daughter near, uh, now ringing each other in the dark of time ago. Very good. Um, there's two raised hands as well, so I just wanted to see who that was. Oh, Mo's had her hands up and Ruth had her hands up. Did you want to say something, Mo? No, no, I, I, I forgot to lower it because I then decided to write. But I would be really interested to know if there's any man male poet in in the room who has anything similar than that long conversations with your friends on the phone mm, that's yeah. interesting <laughs> i wonder i wonder <laughs> no, if i can come in i must say that the idea of, of spending hours on the phone talking to my 17 year old mates that i thought there was something wrong with me <laughs> um, I think that, but as, as males at that age i think we're so more um geared towards 
uh, hunter gathering, spreading our seed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. We don't really stop to think about why. We just get on, get on, and do. Uh, mm -hmm. We are light years, of course, behind um, the dear feminine as a, as a, as a, as a gender. <laughs> and I can only see that uh, our angst starts when we're about 47 to 55. And from there on in, it hits the fan, as they say. So <laughs> we, we enjoy it later. Mm, mm, mm. All the analytical heavy stuff. Oh. <laughs> oh, what about you, Daniel? You here, Andres. Hi, Dan. How are you? Hey, guys. Hey. Uh, yeah, actually, it's funny, like, um, I... I have loads of phone conversations with my friends nowadays, but I think it's because we're so far away. Yeah. So I talk to my friends back in America, yeah. pretty a, a decent amount, you know what I mean? But uh, either way, but I I was just I was just thinking to your question, Molly, like the that myth in general is really interesting because it it's really malleable. Mm. You know, I think did you say I I feel like I've read this poem before because uh, I had I. Um, I'm familiar with Leon's poetry in general, but um, that this, did you say that this wasn't like directly based off of, you know what I mean? It was kind of referential, but like it wasn't, mm. she wrote it with, like not with it specifically in mind necessarily. Yeah, so she, I remember her saying in class that it was after she had written it that people approached her and told her she yeah. had done such a good job with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I like think you know it's the myth is such a fun kind of tool because it can be a little subtle reverberation like mm -hmm. in this in this one or can or I think of like you know the Michael Longley poem like ceasefire mm -hmm. yeah. which is so which is entirely myth but yeah entirely talking about you know like political or so like you know yeah. contemporary events or, and whatnot and it's a way of kind of being oblique in the reverse sense or like the inverse sense yeah and talking about it very directly without talking about it whereas mm -hmm. this poem is kind of doing the opposite of that and both are kind of just interesting yeah, yeah. and you saw you're so right about the malleability of it like in the, the different ways that we can approach it you know and i think i think it's yeah. kind of just up to the pole that there is no there is no wrong way and um, so to say i just before we move on to the next poem i just wanted to see if ruth had anything that you wanted to say if your hand is still up. yeah so i was just kind of getting back to the earthed wire so i suppose when i think of the earthed wire i suppose i'm going back to maybe i suppose electrical terms and things like that and and that grounding force and that that realization for that poet of her mother is actually grounding her and bringing her back down, mm. letting her fly off as far as she needs to go, as far as that cord needs to let her go, but bringing her back down to yeah. earth, grounding yeah. her. And I think that's very important. I think also it's something that kind of stuck with me was the, um, I suppose, the, the listening in venture when we were younger, all of the landlines if you had a second landline your father or mother could hear your phone calls so <laughs> they might pick up the phone and put the receiver part down so they could hear what was going on <laughs> so there's oh, a little gosh. bit of that that kind of stings with me as well you know that kind of listening in but not being there and yeah yeah, yeah. so and that underworld speaking to the underworld so i yeah. am yeah, I totally, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, and yeah, I remember listening to people's conversations. Yeah, I would, I would, I would have listened. To <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, and so, and that just kind of, you know, putting the receiver part down, but listening to the conversation and hearing all that's there, and probably that heart wrenching part that you're listening to, maybe your daughter hearing or saying something awful, mm -hmm. and and I know we're a little bit flippant about the idea of suicide and stuff there because I know it's teenage angst yeah. and stuff but yeah. like for a parent to hear that yeah. might be very upsetting and so yeah. it's like it's very weighted but also that recognition that her mom let her say these things yeah yeah I absolutely agree yeah and and, and that that sense of wanting to kind of step in and stuff as well and um, but holding back yeah thank you thank you Ruth that was really good insight and um, so we'll just move on to another poem um, just conscious of time passing 
Um, and instead, I'm just conscious of what Mona said about how it's similar to my story in my life. So instead of doing the next one, we'll move on to another one because the next one is quite similar to my life. So we'll go back to that one after. Um, so it doesn't feel like I've chosen all these figures being poems based on my life. So um, Persephone falling. So I wonder if anyone wants to read this. Um, so we can explore it just to remind ourselves um, of what the poem is about. If anyone wants to put your hand up and read it. I don't mind reading it as well. No problem. Hmm. Two participants raised hands. So who did? Um, Ruth, do you want to read it? So, Or is your hand still raised? Mary, My hand is still raised, but I read it. That's so happy. That's so happy about us. Um, so are you happy? happy? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Persephone falling. One narcissus among the ordinary beautiful flowers. One unlike the others. She pulled, stooped to pull harder. When sprung out of the earth on this, his glittering terrible carriage, sorry, carriage, he claimed his due. It finished. No one heard her, no one. She had strayed from the herd. Remember, go straight to school. This is important, stop fooling around. Don't answer to strangers, stick with your playmates, keep your eyes down. This is how easily the pit opens. This is how one foot sinks into the ground. Beautiful. Thank you, Ruth. That was really well read. Um, yeah. So I love this poem. This is just another example of how we can look at the myth and relate it to contemporary society and maybe issues in, in modernity. Um, I think it's really powerful. Um, so I, and, you know, Rita Dove is a really fascinating poet. That's definitely worth um, reading and exploring. Um, so I wonder, does anyone have, have any kind of connection to this poem? Maybe did it resonate for you? I think it was an interesting way to deal with the myth. Um, if anyone wants to put things in the chat or if you want to raise a hand and kind of explore the myth. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Can I speak? Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Uh, just that, yeah, it, like lots of myths, um, this one deals with uh, violence, really. Um, you know, Hades was violent. He, he decided he wanted something and he took it um, from a woman. And, um, and that's what this poem seems to kind of acknowledge, that there is that danger. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, yeah, and I suppose even in in more recent years, it is you know it's on the news nearly all. Mm. You know, it's it's something that we often see, and and one way to um to use myths in your poetry is to think about those things that are on the news, and um, think about those things that are affecting people um in modernity really as well. And uh, what about uh, Marie Stevens? I think you have raised your hand. Do you want to say something about the poem? Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's Moira. Um. Yeah, it, no, that's right. um, yeah, this one to me, it's making a very direct comparison, really, bringing it right through much more um, easy to see the present day um, parallels because yeah. you've got the go out on your own and something bad can happen, and that comes straight home from school. Mm -hmm. don't talk to strangers and everything so it's very um like I say it it just brings it I think it makes it very straightforward uh, like I said the comparison it's now yeah. then the girl can't help it if you don't do what you're supposed to be doing so if you don't follow with where you're supposed to be yeah. something bad can happen yeah that's basically what it seems to be saying it's not right mm -hmm. that warning yeah that living like the way now they as well you could even put now carry your keys in your hand yeah that sort yeah, of thing. It's, it's, yeah. it's it's that message really being 
shown. Yeah, and the use of the the imperative tense really can be so strong in poetry. That kind of don't and keep and that kind of it's a really strong language, um, which I think really makes the message jump off the page. Um, so, um, unless someone has something kind of really urgent and pressing they really want to say about this poem, we might move on to the next one if that's okay. Um, but of course, speak now if you have something but, really important. Yeah. Well, yeah. Can, can I say something controversial? Of course. Of course. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm still <laughs> sometimes a translator, but some I, I translated 50 Mills and Boons and other, um, uh, you know, fantasy books that are devour, devoured by women. And the, the, the whole structure is always that the man that, that they hate a man and then they fall mm -hmm. for him. And that's that's the whole thing. And it's sort of with the previous uh, description of hate as well. And here, too, there is something about the kind of the dangerous, dark stranger that you yeah. shouldn't fall for. But then you then you fall for them. I don't know what to do with that information, but that's in this this one as well. You know, mm. we shouldn't mm. do it. Or it's, I'm not sure if it's a warning or if it's something in us. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. abusive relationship or you, or you you marry your father or you know there's something <laughs> psychologically weird going. I don't know what. No, you're so right, and I think that we grow up, we grow up with those stories. Yeah. You know, even in Disney sells us those stories. Um, and I wonder, do we just take on that subconsciously? And then do we make decisions based on based on what we, you know, grew up with, those those meta narratives? Yeah, I think you're you're absolutely so right. It's interesting to think to think about um to think about that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you most. Um so I might just go on to the next poem, which is uh, a little bit funnier, so it's interesting. Um, Persephone suffering from sad by Nula Nigona. Um, so I wonder, does anyone want to read this? You can put up your hand, or you can read it. I don't mind. Uh, Margaret, do you want to read it? Yes, but um, Ruth had her hand up there for ages. <laughs> oh, sorry, Ruth. I didn't see. Sorry, Ruth. Do you want to read that? Sorry, don't worry about me. I was just making a, a little comment there. I put it in the chat. Don't worry. Sorry. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um. Anyway, this is called Persephone suffering from SAD. Now, don't go ringing the cops, Mum, and don't go losing the bat. I admit I was out of line and over the top when I hitched a ride with that sexy guy in his wow of a BMW. But he was such a super chat up, I couldn't give him the push. He booked us a foreign holiday, no travel agent runs. His car so jet propelled with revs, the engine soared on wings. He said he would buy me velvet gowns and satin under things and his credit's fine. He leaves me space, though I'd have to say there's not much light in the place. He's signing me the title deeds to all his stately homes. He's for putting my name in lights as a star on the silver screen. He has me flooded with rings and pearls, but the menu's pretty thin, pretty thin. I've just been served a pomegranate. It's crimson, dripping with seeds. There's just one more line, so it's just a veritable. Oh, yeah, a veritable cave of, of drops of blood. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, this is, you know, different altogether. So, I suppose we read two kind of heavy poems. Um, and this is a little bit more quirky, um, a different take on it, kind of shows how we can. How we can, you know, approach myths in in different in different ways. Really. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a good poem. I like it a lot. Um, I wonder, does anyone, you know, resonate with this one? Do they think that this is a better way to approach it? I mean, there is no wrong way to approach a myth. A myth, really. For me, anyway, I know I love that that last line. I think it's really good. Uh, we suppose uh, we haven't heard from from Janet. Do you want to say something, Janet? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say it's got 
a lovely sort of rhythm and rhyme to it, which is kind of, you know, some some myths are just like fairy tales and it's got that sing-songy thing to it, which mm. kind of disguises the message in it of, you know, that there's something a bit more in there, but you have to dig a little bit deeper maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think humor humor is a great way to do that, to deal with heavy topics, you know. Mm. You're so right. Yeah, and I think it's a fun way to do it. I almost get the sense that the poet had a really good time writing it. Yeah. You know? uh, which I think if you're having a good time writing something, it comes through in your writing mm. and the reader is going to have a good time reading it. So, yeah, it's a different experience for sure. Um, what about you, Moira? How did you feel about this poem? Well, this one, it's like a different take on Persephone because with some of the others it's like she wanders away from the crowd and then he attacks her and drags her but it's this it's like she's gone off looking for adventure and yeah. she's found it and she's yeah. so it's like a more powerful Persephone to me yeah just this girl that things happens to yeah yeah she's more autonomous yeah I yeah. totally totally agree yeah and she's a little bit more light-hearted and she's you know yeah, yeah. I totally agree yeah it's a different it's angle all together yeah taking it for all she can get yeah yeah <laughs> yeah we have a few things um in the chat so Therese was saying that Persephone is seduced by promises interesting yeah, I suppose she kind of is. Yeah, maybe. So then Ada says, Little Red Riding Hood is also about sexual predators taking, talking of fairy tales. Little Red Persephone with her father. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, it's interesting. I think that the stories we grew up with are often so dark. Um, and something too definitely that I have explored in my in my poetry is even you know the story of Hansel and Gretel was uh, background is in the famine you know so Jan says the voice is jaded she's been there for a while oh, so that's the other one this pitch isn't fresh she's and she's made some kind of identity there oh interesting yeah the idea that we that we become our darkness that we if we allow ourselves to um yeah you know become so engulfed by by where we are in our situation we can't allow it to, to kind of take over our personality that's really interesting margaret do you have something to say about this poem yeah the thing that strikes me most is the line he leaves me space though i'd have to say there's not much light in the place yeah yeah but she sees through him yeah i love that i love that she sees through him and she's not totally vulnerable yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah, this is a definitely kind of that more, um, you know, the personality I think really shines through in this poem. I think maybe that the poet is in a good headspace um, in comparison to what we've seen before. And um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think, did Ruth, you've got your hand raised there, is that? Sorry. Yeah, I suppose the the um, theme around Persephone and Hades is that she actually is is happy with him when mm. she is down there, despite how she came to be down there. And um, and the agreement between her mother and Hades is that she will remain for however many months. But like, I suppose it's the, look at all the things this guy has given her, like Hades has, because he Hades made her a beautiful space down below in the underworld. He made her the queen of the underworld. Like he really went all out. So I suppose it's, you decide what choices you make. Mm -hmm. And even though it wasn't her choice originally, she decided ultimately this might be better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah. What can I make of my situation? Um, a bit like, kind of like, I don't mean to really compare it to it right now you know we're all in lockdown and it's kind of like well, we're coming out of it but it's like what what can you make of your situation how can you how can you make it bearable for you like how can you be happy in it um that's a really cool Ruth. I like I like that insight mm -hmm. and Marie um Stevens I'm sorry Myra Stevens says she's gone looking for adventure and the good life but found it is not all she thought it would be interesting. Is it that the poems come at different angles from the same human perspective, the need to express the fundamental attraction? Interesting, yeah. I think the same, yeah. 
it's really just kind of tackling it in different ways. So before we, I want to, I really want to look at this poem because this is one of my favorite poems. I think it's beautiful um, before we start writing our own poems. Um, so this is Carol Ann Duffy, the, World Wife, the World's Wife. And The World's Wife is a fantastic collection, in my opinion. Um, she takes a lot of big characters um, and, you know, often where the women have been um, silenced, you know, so she writes from their perspective. Um, it's a really, really fascinating, creative um, collection. So there's just one must leave Mary is tired after second vaccine job. Well, that's fantastic, Mary. I'm so delighted you got your vaccine. And um, thank you so much, Mary. See you soon. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks very much, Molly. It's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So I'll just quickly read this one. So Demetra, where I lived, winter and hard earth, I sat in my cold stone room, choosing tough words, granite, flint, to break the ice my broken heart. I tried that, but it skimmed flat over the frozen lake. She came from a long way, long, long way, but I saw her at last walking. My daughter, my girl, across the fields in bare feet, bringing all spring's flowers to her mother's house. I swear the air softened and warmed as she moved, the blue sky smiling none too soon with the small shy mouth of a new moon. Um, so I wanted to finish with that one because I think it is kind of hopeful and beautiful. Um, and when I read it, for me, I don't know about everyone else, but when I read it, I'm reminded of, you know, um, especially in modernity, in kind of, you know, divorced parents and that's you know, having your child return after they're gone for a while, um, that kind of sense of um, of return really, and that mother daughter relationship again, that strength of emotion. Um, so I, I really really love this poem and also how the seasons come into it, the use of the moon as well. Um, I think it's really beautiful, um, and I absolutely love the line about um, skimming the broken heart over the frozen lake. I think it's gorgeous. <laughs> So I wonder, does anyone have anything to say about this poem by Carol Ann Duffy? Yeah, Mona, you've got your hand. Well, I, I'd just like to say that um, as you wisely picked the myths of Persephone tonight, I think that poem in particular uh, reflects uh, uh, the mother-daughter relationship. I resorted to that the mythology uh, to write a poem about my daughter going off with her J1 visa in the 80s mm. and uh, I use the Persephone and Demeter theme mm. and I think it's a fantastic um, th the whole Persephone Demeter Hades thing is a brilliant um, what's the word resort for people who want to write poems about the mother-daughter relationship yeah yeah. You know, for example, yeah. that one time I, I remember wanting to talk about what's showing in this poem, like the 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 the, the joy when they return. Yeah. You know? mm. And yeah. It, it's it's just wonderful to be able to resort to something like that uh -huh. to reflect your own relationships, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I absolutely agree. Yeah. But I think as well, like um, it's also been used, you know, to reflect others like the one that I, I'm not sure that we will have time to look at is one of my favorite poems by Philip um, Gross where he where he's imagining himself as Hades going down to visit um, his daughter in the underworld you know I think and I think possibly that that that's unexplored territory a little bit I think there's a lot of fertile ground in terms of Hades and, and in terms of of um, in terms of his and in, in terms of Zeus, even the father in the situation. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's very fertile for yeah. for any poet. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, and I think that that's um, something that I'd love to read more. I'd really love to read more poems about the male perspective in in the myth. I think. You know? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, but I to I totally absolutely am so delighted that it's been fertile for you as well, Mona. Mm -hmm. So, does anyone else have anything to say about this poem? Um, Ruth, you have your hand raised.
Mm, so does, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce, um, is it door? Yes. Lovely. Yeah, I noticed it's, it's interesting that like in this one and in the phone one that we read at first, um, mm. there's the aspect of speech, like there's the arse poetic and the female sort of speech and voice element mm. um, that I think is um, really, it's, it's almost playing with the, with the narrative to, to counteract w where the story sends you in terms mm -hmm. of he's kidnapped to the underworld. Everyone else is um, bargaining for her, for her freedom or her company or her, and, and here um, the hope is in her speech. The new moon is in her speech. And in the other one, her speech was the, the grounding thing and the connection to other people. Um, yeah. Yeah, this in there, the power is that you're saying the power of the language in, in this poem. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah, and it's so it or so right. It's really just blooming with hope. That's why I think it's a lovely, a lovely poem. I think it's just it makes me smile, you know, it makes me feel happy. So but what about you, um, Janet? Uh, yeah, I well, I was going to say very similar things to I think it was Mona about just the strength of the connection between the mother and the daughter, and the, there's just lovely ways that she does it when she says, "My daughter, my girl." It's so touching that, and also that she was walking in her bare feet. Yeah, um, and then the the lovely kind of. Um, the way it's got nature threaded through the so well. so so simple but yeah really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, you're, and you're so right, because I think Caroline Duffy's, one of Caroline Duffy's strengths is that the language is never complicated and it's never hard to read. It's always accessible, but always incredibly beautiful. Um, I think you're so right, Janet. And, and just, I think Ruth, I'm not sure if you wanted to say something. Um, if not, there's two things in the chat anyway. So Jan said, I like the repetition of long, long. It feels long because of the repetition, like a long, long time ago. And the reference to the moon in the end makes me think of the menses. Yeah, it's kind of that connection. Not loss of the child, but fertility returning. Yeah, that's really cool. Good point, Jan. I really, really like that. And then Therese says, very mythical image. She came from, I saw her at last walking my daughter and my girl across the field. Yeah, it's, it's so gorgeous. It really is. And then Ruth said, sorry, let your hand up. That's fine, Ruth. Um, no problem. So I wanted to just kind of give us a chance to write, you know, um, to think about our own experiences and how we resonate with the myth um, and, you know, perhaps to come up with our own even just start of a poem. So I did kind of think about some questions to consider in relation to the myth. So I want to give us about like maybe 10 minutes to kind of see what we can come up with and then maybe we can come back and kind of share um, our own relation to the myth. So um, just kind of, um, yeah, so these are just some questions to consider. You don't even have to read them if you don't want to. I just want to give us around 10 to 15 minutes writing time now to see if we can produce something from the myth, um, you know, and maybe even if right now the myth isn't working for you I just I just want to give you a chance to write and see if you can produce something so I had these questions and um, but you can feel free to mute me while I keep talking um, in case I'm annoying you um, so in the pomegranate Ivan Boland says can she can enter this myth anywhere so where in your life can you enter the story of Demeter and Persephone and then what character do you relate to and why what part of the myth resonates with you the most does any part of the myth annoy you? Do you empathize with any of the character? Does the myth remind you of an issue in modernity? And who does the myth leave out? Is there a story that it neglects to tell? So I think maybe we'll just kind of go now. It's um, 21.40. So if we go to maybe 21.50 and at the end, we can kind of share what we, what we kind of managed to come up with. I know that's a very short time, but... Um, hopefully even a sentence is better than, than nothing. Janet has something. Well, I'll go, I'll go first, give others the excuse. 
Uh, deranged, undone by loss, Demeter wanders. She gathers up snapped ties, weaves back a rope to pull her daughter up. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's fab. Thanks. <laughs> wow, that is gorgeous. I love the ending as well. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Janet. It's gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you. So anyone else there? So Ada, you have your hand up. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I was just improvising in my head and I went up with something I didn't intend to come up with, but I like it. I think it's funny. I called it crisis. Uh, it's a dialogue, mostly. I'm a terrible person, am I not? But I see you like bastards, Persephone. Here's a pomegranate. I'm allergic to those. A seed won't hurt. A seed always hurts. Whatever. Be a Spartan, have it? No. Ah, go on. No. Hey ho, okay, you stole enough time. Here comes Hermes to collect you. Well done. Oh my god, what a. Hey, you there, you like fruit? Not especially, sir, but I was running like hell to be in time to collect this here poor less. Bit thirsty. Have a pomegranate. Good refresher day. Oh, fine. Epilogue. So Hades and Hermes stayed together for some while. And because Hermes neglected to support trade and all issues financial, there was a crisis. Oh no. Persephone returned safely home, though. That's <laughs> <laughs> so sad. It's a bit of a gay story today. Yeah, yeah, I love it, though. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. That's, so, that's brilliant. That's so vibrant. Thank you. I'm <laughs> Moos. What about you? Okay. Um, where am I? Okay. It's called Mixed Myths Myth. I always wished for an Earth Mother in sync with the elements and seasons inside herself, one with the soil, the seed, diving with abandon into the sky waterfall. What I got was the snow queen, frosty but beautiful, who left me alone mostly to play with the ice flow jigsaw. As I forgot to continue with my quest to save the young Pan whom I love, yes, Yet she wasn't really fickle or disloyal and would have readily gone down into the abyss that she knew so well that she realized I needed saving. Mm, beautiful. I love that last line, had she realized I needed saving. Gorgeous, Moses. Thank you. Really, really nice. And um, what about you, Lauren? Thank you, Molly. Um, trembling ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> The ghosts tremble like dogs of thunder with each contraction of the world's womb. The quick souls dive in the blood of the sticks, lest a shaft of sun should pierce their gloom. The slow stand rooted in the lost groves, they grasp for another but catch only air. Mm. Wow, something about uh, last lines in Devaris. Anyway, that was gorgeous. That was really nice. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so Moira. Okay, this is going to depend on how well I can read it because my light's not great and my eyes are worse. And my handwriting is appalling. Um, okay. We did not notice gathering flowers, laughing, talking sharing secrets of love and life. If she should have spoken, should have stayed, not strayed. Why didn't she say something? Why did she wander? It was not our fault. Um, what am I up to? We're not her mother, not her guardians. She left us, she walked away. Now the flowers die. Earth's made barren by salt tears. It's not our fault. Mm, gorgeous, gorgeous, Myra. I love Earth is made barren by salt tears. That's lovely, really nice. Thank you. Um, Ruth? Yeah, so uh, this is called Returning from Lydia, 1984. My father was out there as an electrician. Returning from Libya, 1984, you introduced us to this pomegranate. You showed me how to score the skin and pull it open, ruby pearls tumbling. My fingers stained yellow, 
your stained yellow by John Player Blue. You are in the underworld now. Do your gale, Persephone, with the tales of youth and stories that I lapped up. Do you smoke a fag and laugh and sup a Heineken with Hades? All the pomegranate seeds, they cannot take me to you. Perfect. I really love that. I love the, the John Player Blue and the Heineken, those contemporary details. Thank you, that's fab. Thank you. Catherine, what about you? Um, yeah, not a masterpiece, but she will give it a go anyway. Uh, I called it Spring. You showed up just in time. Take me to your cool underworld. Save me from the boredom of daisy chains and honeyed speech. I ran in naked belief, coins on my eyes. Now surprise me. Show me the purple miracle of new moons, blue black darkness in the tuber of spring before it erupts, boiling on my skin. Ah, that's great, Catherine. So good. So good. Great. Thank you. Such good energy. Um, Max, you said you might do one. I'm always afraid to do one, but sure, you're right off. Sure, look, it's whatever the gut reaction is you want, isn't that it? Okay, so this is a bit, a bit devoluted. Your daughter, I watched you as you bent to pick your meadow flower and heard at Lachico, the Lothario held angel who roared by on his burning rubber and slashed you on his pillion. Drive downhill to his lair how we both cried our tears of despair, you both. And summonsed that satin richness of her maze to woo you back, my covert arbitrator, who had to park on seed to your one pomegranate seed. I thought of those that Arab child, the Boko Haram of Shibuk, and I thought, at least I thought, I got you back and uh, I'm sorry. At least I thought I got you back in part, one dividend alone left for the dark. That's I love that. I love that sound of part and dark. It's gorgeous, nice. Thank you. <laughs> really, really nice. Um, Moira, I'm not quite sure what you mean. What did Demetrius say to the friends? Which friends? That's what uh, my poem part was about. You yeah. said about the other characters and it was the friends. Mm. So what was she saying to them? Was she mad at them? Did they get blamed by people? My son, when he was 15, got drunk once at a party mm. and um, the friends let him leave on his own. Yeah. Um, and he walked back. We live out, we live by the sea. Oh, yeah. To the, to the friends that were with Persephone. So, yeah. Hours. Oh yeah. That's, That's what, I yeah. didn't think you'd got what yeah. it's about. <laughs> now I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a brilliant perspective. Really, really. So can I just say the muses that had left for Stephanie did realise he had left, but by the time they got back, they didn't realise what to do. And when they went to Demeter, they were really upset. Mm. Mm. But let's say it's like you know, it's it's not. It's not their fault. It, you, it's what the friends say. I, I remember having a conversation with my son's friends and saying, look, you can't let somebody just go off on their own. Yeah. You know, you don't know what's... Mm. I'd say mm. where we are, but there was a kid... Yeah, there's lots of things, but did the friends feel guilty? Did the meet to get mm. mad at them? Did That's right, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. That's really, really original. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maya. Um, I wonder, does anyone have a poem just before we finish up? Is there any straggling poem left in the back of anyone's mind, Susanna? So I thought this could be Persephone's uh, voice uh, as a teenager. <laughs> um, my breasts of peach wanted to be held and, and told you were picked. I, the absolute me, wanted to be the one forever, I said. I was not taught anything different but to want to be the only one forever. 
With golden shoes, I climb the darkness and I sit on top of her head. She's like a beast. She's like my mother. Dark are the secrets of women. If, what if I choose darkness? Want to find something in it. Mm, yeah, to find something in it, fab. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Susanna. Theo Dorgan used to, used to say that maybe Eurydice chose the darkness and she wanted to go down. That's what your poem reminds me of. Um, it's brilliant, thank you. Um, I think that Jan wrote a poem in the chat, so I might read it out. So I strayed so far in a field of flowers. I left the open world and wedded haze, a contract I could not get out of. I lost time looking for exit. What is there to hope for among the ghosts? What flower is here? Lovely, really good direct uh, reference to the myth there at the end as well. That's gorgeous. Thank you, Jan. Um, Therese says she wrote a mediocre poem, so I don't think there's any such thing as a mediocre poem if Therese is able to read her poem. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, it really is mediocre, but I mean, the, the myth is so rich, there's so much you could do with it, but anyway, I'll read it, so. But what of me, I asked, it seemed so cold to me to tear me from my family. Without a thought of my own need, my mother's gaze now at a loss, the cost her own dear child was forced on bending to sever ties of love. Unending my love was transport and brought me to those I loved and my dear home. But strange as though I know it seems, my heart enlarged, my heart made room. And deep inside, the loves I loved now multiplied. Beautiful, beautiful, really nice, yeah. Kind of mediocre. <laughs> no, not at all, no such thing. Thank you, Therese. It's fabulous. Thank you. Um, so I think that that is it. If I don't know if there's anyone else who has poems. Anyway. Um, well, anyway, thank you so much for having me and thank you for listening to me read and for going through all, all of that, those mythology poems and to um, entertaining me as well for, <laughs> for the hour and a half. So thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you very much. I might pass the host back on to Mo there now. Thanks, Molly. That was fabulous. Well, absolutely wonderful. Really yeah. enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, you're very modest, Molly, but it's really, really good what you're doing, and it's really inspiring as well. Although we seem to have lost all the men, but <laughs> <laughs> that's their loss. <laughs> I was wondering. Um, whether uh, there are people who want to read something else as in open mic kind of stuff because like it, it, okay That's i have I'm, I'm writing um a series of poems based on my dissertation which was with homeless women and so i i, I just wrote the first one and it, it's called agnes because that's the name she chose like some highway of broken dreams, this boulevard is not at all what it seems. Shards of light, it seems, pour out like beams in life awakened, no dreams forsaken. My body aching, but joy, ah, no mistaking it, a boy. This glory pierced my endless cry, and why I was forsaken, cast aside and minimized by a family, all consumed with wine and ale, while my spindly little girl legs could not fail to carry siblings on my back. As truant officers track the days we missed at school, now broken, no relief in sight, alone and brave, I took flight to make a better world. But then I, the love I met too broken to sustain a fall again. I was alone and then a kindly night in armor came. We crossed the threshold of my pain within a decade he was gone and cared for in a nursing home. I, a mother with two sons alone, set out to mother and to work, for that is what a mother is, stand up, refuse suspicious stares, and seek new meaning everywhere. An urban gorilla, I confront the pillars of community who only see the scars of their lives seared into my heart and offer no respite or care apart from a shelter. I am not a victim of their gaze, but a mother who will discover a life for my children. When I became your mother, we claimed our inheritance. We stand alive in our universe, never to be told again we are useless. 
The punctum pierced your endless lies, a baby born with bright blue eyes, and followed then my second son, and joy and laughter filled our home. And now that our lives have begun, meaning flowered like the sun, and tells the story of our love and all the battles we have won, still your lies seek our shame and claim only those you name are worthy of a mother's fame. Now in my infant's eyes, I see the glory that surrounds me when first I cried out, give me your grace. I see it now in my baby's face. That's lovely. Beautiful. Thanks. Fun, fun Thank you, Therese. Uh, it's fun to read. Thank you. Uh, so next, um, if, if anybody else wants to go for the open mic, just uh, if you pop your name into the chat and I can start making a list. And uh, the, the first next person that I have on my list is Catherine. A great evening, everyone. Fantastic. Um, I wrote this poem about my grandmother and I call it Time Sings Solo. Bleeding fuchsias, dripping wine to steps, trees spilling light and so they are hung ripe, stretching branches awake to wet and windy dreams the spell has sounded and the sea beckons to stir ashes into consciousness such frail remains throw maudlin to the winds arms of grass are thrown about you these shackles sing to you of life with aerial breath i stand sentry to solitude now watch you war with mutinous army and weakening lines Mountains erupt on your ragged coastline, purple and stark. Birds are soaring across great divides to echo the cries that you raise to hell. Drenched under relentless heat, humbled to its cold hand, these beds are still and treacherous. Stones are splitting their sides with salt and moaning in torrents, tumbling from your cliff Face, a woman born before her time. Ah, very good. Thank okay. you, Catherine. Lovely, Catherine. Uh, next on my list, uh, Marie, would you like to read? Moira, is it me? Moira, sorry. Yeah, Thanks. no, no, no. It's, it looks so like Marie, but I always worry in case there's going to be a Marie somewhere. I, I, sh I, should, I should know better. There's a father there. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a univocalism. Green eyes. Uh, by the trees he met her, tenderly held her, screened by the trees, gently bedded her, then wedded her. Green-eyed, he kept her, fenced her, never let her be, never let her free. He needed her, knew he needed help, yet never helped her, never heeded her needs, never knew her depths. He yelled, she wept, he yelled and belted her, welted her deep red welts. Bereft, she knelt there, bled there. When next he slept there, she left there fled there. By the tree he'd met her, hemp held her velvet neck. Mm. Greened by the trees, green eyes weep. Thank you, Moira. Uh, next on my list, Ada, would you like to read? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to connect to the myth and thanks Molly again for the great poems and showcase in other people's poems as well and being a wonderful facilitator, workshop facilitator it was great fun. And mine is about Hades as well, but Hades not as a god but as a place and it's two poems that one sprung from another. Like the first I will read, I wrote or with a method I called blind type where I type the sequences of letters and then my brain suggests what words they look like and then I cook it up into a poem and it's called An Egg from Hades. Uh, somebody hugs Dow, eats toffee, she's a zigzag and a decibel, she's never hushed. Hazardous moved south with an egg from Hades, 
a reticent kung fu task free, a rocket, a huge jovial dyke, she talks with auras. This is the first one. And disclaimer, the word dyke is used in a friendly way here. And the second poem is around the same idea, but the image of the act from Hades, but here it's like about the album and the cycle. Uh, and I made it into a song actually. And so I'll drop a link later to that. And that's why there are so many lines repeating here because it was originally a song. I just uh, jotted down the lyrics. Don't step on it. I carry an egg from Hades. It grows every month. It grows every month. An egg from Hades. Don't step on it. It's cursed. Don't step on it. It's cursed. Now it's a stain. Now it's a stain. Don't step on it. Don't step on it. It's cursed. Now it's a stain. Don't step on it. I carry an egg from Hades. An egg from Hades. And there are a lot of don't step on it. It's cursed. Now it's a stain, don't step on it, it's cursed, for Christ's sake, don't step on it, now it's a stain. An egg from Hades, I carry, don't step on it, it's cursed, it's cursed, it's cursed. <laughs> That's it. So it's like a, a bit of an irony thing is there, and I hope you get it, so it's not a series. And I'll drop a link if anyone's interested, it's a bit of an experimental uh, I combined punk vocals and black metal vocals and a bit of funky guitar with a bit of a synthesizer as well. You can check it out. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Eva. Uh, next, Margaret, would you like to read? Thanks, Lauren. Um, because of the situation in um, Palestine at the moment. I'm going to read a poem by somebody else. It's um, by John W. Sexton. And it's, pub it, well, I don't think he has recorded it yet, even though he said he would. I bit, put a bit of pressure on him. It's called A Revised Natural History and Human Geography of Palestine. Sky. You have no sky. The sky is ours. Necessary for our safety and national security. Do not look up. Do not imagine that any blue above your heads is yours to claim. The sky is ours to enjoy or to annihilate. Water, sewerage we freely gift to you and brine. Flora, we reach out to you, O oh, olives, almonds, apricots, O oh, oranges, we grasp you. O oh, you pines and cypress, carob and acacia, we measure you for lumber. Fauna, no ibex or gazelles shall you have, nor eagles, vultures or kestrels. The owl rises up and is us. We pluck you from the land, you mouselings. Habitation, of your cities we make you great mountains of rubble. Deep crevices we leave for you to shade in. Terrorism, there are no true terrors except the ones perpetuated against us. The pure terrors we offer you will be everlasting peace. Hope, there is no hope for you. All hope belongs to us, essential for our safety and national security. Do not cry out to the nations. They're not concerned for your bloodshed, your tears or your cries. Do not waste yourselves on hope. John W. Sexton. And, um, the, there's a new um, group for poets, if you, if any of you um, are moved to write about the situation in Palestine at the moment, it's called Irish Poets for Palestine. So um, please join it if you feel so inclined, and especially if you can record yourself reading your own poem, if you have one, for three minutes or less. Thank you. Jesus. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, next on the list is uh, Susanna. Would you like to read? Thanks. So inspired by the myth, I'm gonna read this. Uh, this is um, uh, dedicated to my great auntie. And she used to live in the street of Messina between Caridi and uh, Shilla, which are the two monsters that uh, Ulysses had to cross to get into the underworld. Um, some summer afternoons, 
My childhood is a small triangle of light, an enclosed wild garden where the natal is high and the Judas tree looks back at you. I do not remember how many steps I need to crawl to my auntie's kitchen, but I can feel the rough wood under my bare feet and hands while, their, while her voice is leads, me, leads me upstairs. She's the captain of my boat, the loudest voice, who knows how to grow tomatoes with no water and when to harvest grapes without touching them. Her nose always into somebody else's business and her shirt is bright white under the red lipsticks. No ring on her fingers and no safety bell while she drives. I sit on her side, pulling the foam out of the hot plastic seat of the old Renault. A new chapter of the Odyssey is unfolding from her smoky lips while driving in the dry river of the summer afternoons. The car bounces and bumps while we laugh and scream and the apricots fall from the uh, seat. We lit the dirt too. The femme fatale Circe turns Ulysses and his old crew into pigs. That's what happens to men who don't return their love. I see Ulysses as a tall, hairy, beardy man with bad clothes and a bad breath, like the fishermen we saw on the beach where Ulysses faced Caridi. A world of sirens, dark and untouched, is left unsung by the poets. Where are the women in the fairy tales when men complete their quest? They make fried aubergines and stuffed olives. I lose my shoes. She buys me sandals, red little sandals. They make my feet bleed. I keep them with me in the sleep. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Thanks. Uh, next, uh, Janet, would you like to read? Yep, thanks. I'll just find it. Um, oh, sorry, I can't find it. I'll find it now. Okay, it's um, it's a Persephone poem. Um, I wrote it a while ago and it was my first attempt at, uh, I think it's a villanelle, I think. Uh, Persephone lives in the underworld. I've crossed over now, foregoing futures to live more fully in the dark. Shadows of a field flung across the underworld, I've crossed over now finding my way along paths of fallen leaves to live more fully in the dark, listening to softened sound, watching the road ahead, I've crossed over now, left the uplift of spring far behind to live more fully in the dark, expectations receding like lights glanced in a mirror, I've crossed over now to live more fully in the dark. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Since we're doing uh, pretty good on time, um, I have a poem on the very topic of the myth tonight. So I thought I might read you that. <clears throat> Erebus. Erebus screams the neon sign through a flood of falling flame. Wet shadows form shifting lines to await judgment at the door where pinned to every left lapel is Cerberus, debossed in gold. She walks among the shadows, heels drumming stiletto beats in time with the boom boom roaring from forbidden rooms, <clears throat> past the pillared velvet twists and in the door staff only. She greets Venus and kisses Juno, Diana's at her mirror, she tells her to move over. Hang up coat, get undressed, powder face, neck and breasts. Has anyone seen my flowers? Hectate hides in feathered faces and gifts elixirs to mortal sisters. White rocks stamped with arrows. 
gone again in one quick swallow. She clicks a stick of carmine wax and paints her lips with crushed nymphs. Naughty uncles, here she is, your baby niece Persephone, shouts Minos in the microphone. She performs on cue, straddles. The stage bites open overripe plums. Juice squirts, dripping her pale flesh. Her jaw is tight and pupils blown. She's dead to what comes next. As told, she picks a front row god and puts a plum between her breasts. She swaps the stage for two bent knees and begs of Pluto, feast on me. Thank you very much. And then um, I have one more person on the list. So if anybody else would like to uh, read tonight, just pop your name into the chat. Um, um, but otherwise, uh, Mags, would you like to read? Okay. Um, right. And I thought we had to write some little bit of open mic for classical things. So I, I just remembered a poem I wrote a long time ago. Um, and um, I still love that song, you know, Lydia, Lydia, I, I understand, you know, it's the one by um, Andrew um, Friedman. So I was in Peter Marks one day when I used to go there. And this girl came up and said to them, her name was Lydia and she had a particular look to her, I felt like drawing her. But I, I remembered the story of Lydia that my father had told me. So here's this one. And Peter marks Lydia. A Greek lady sold cloths of purple, boiled in lead baths, eyes extracted from marine snails that odor plumed from their steam for days, they say. And she made her shades of Tyrian. A single vessel of devotion, Paul's first convert. Her name was Lydia from the island, the city of Sarathira, an island of the Greek archipelago. There's this merchant's name to this day. Millennium passed on. Mid lavage of lustrous locks, a Peter Marx girl pipes up her ancient name amongst the untamed mains of burgundy and gold. Most thought that she was named for a lyric of Andrew Gould or for the random wife of a French actor and um, on Thespian Amorose. True provenance lay, I say, in the island of Lydia. Gold tressed on genou, poised, dignified among the sinks. She soaks the colours, watches as they drink into the pates. Palettes mixed, emulsified the deep shades Pipster, purple. Oh, she says, I am an artiste. Lydia whispered to me, echoes of the ancient, may her muse come pay homage to me, my Phrygian seas, and perhaps then both my Alpha and her Omega we will see. Good mad point. <laughs> but, uh, how was it? Thank you, Mags. Uh, next up, uh, Moza, would you like to read? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. So, glib words. Glib words. Patch in the chest. Colder than ice. Undercooled doesn't even begin to cover it. A huge pain of failing, not me. Others who should be saved but fall victim. This isn't about me, shouldn't be about me, can never be about me, but there it is again, all about me, not keeping them safe, not protect protecting them against death, torture, guilty by implication, guilty by watching it, guilty by not doing enough to stop it. All of us together, torn limb from limb, bombed into oblivion, mother watching a child's anguish, unable to stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Nothing is worth this pain. It is not self-defense. It is not treating others as you want to be treated, you or your children. There are other solutions. You didn't bother. Your appetite for destruction is too great and you blame someone else. I blame me, my coldness. Wow. Thank you, Moza. Mm. 
now the, the last reader I have on the list, there's still time if anyone else wants to jump in. Um, Ruth, would you like to read? Yeah, it's just a short one and it's a mother-daughter poem <clears throat> called Comfort of a Parent. Childhood worries wake, cold nose, overthoughts, little ones find my bed. Smells of washed hair and new pajamas and jitter skin rests on sheets and soft soles touch my calves and drift back to back. Serenity and sound breaths takes me to my mother. She ran our lady's kitchen, hands that smelled of onions and Rothmans, striped flannel sheets under pillow dough skin. Skull souls calloused on my calves and back to back, safe together in sleep. Comfort of a parent. Thank you, Ruth. And uh, please shout out, oh, Mona. Okay, great. Mona, would you like to read? Okay, I got a bit of courage from Ruth there. A very simple poem that's self-explanatory. It's called Daily Rituals. Every day she made a wheel of soda bread, one foot round, deep crossed. While it cooled on the windowsill, she climbed the cobbles to the sound of the Angelus bell from the church on the hill to be enfolded in a cloak of incense and lulled by the tinkling of the monstrance chain. She told me things I needed to know, how to peel my image from the mirror and celebrate me. She was playing 45 in Christie's hotel the night the ambulance took her. She played a trump card and collapsed. Later, when I visited, she told me she promised the Sacred Heart she'd give up the fags if he gave her another chance. How do I make the soda bread, I asked. A fist of brown, a fist of white, a pinch of soda, a pinch of salt, sour milk to mix, she rhymed. I mixed, I stirred, even the dog declined. I never felt, I never knew the weight of her fist or the size of her pinch. <laughs> Thank you, Mona. Amanda, would you like to read a poem? Lauren, I have nothing ready. I am just <laughs> enjoying the whole evening, but I will next time, I promise. What about your 57 poem and Demeter? Um, I don't know if I have it, um, Ruth. Um, hang on, let me see if I have it oh, in my notes. So wonderful. Oh, yeah, thanks, Ruth. <laughs> um, hang on, sorry, guys, I wasn't prepared for this at all. I know, um, I, 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 I only a tiny bit put you under pressure there, but I thought I'd chance my arm. You never know. Um, if I can find it, I'll read it, but God only knows where it is. And I encourage you, Lauren. So we keep talking. <laughs> until Amanda gets I keep talking, guys. Together. Sorry about yeah. this. I just can't yeah. find it. Yeah, oh. you're a bad influencer, so I'll blame you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll read. I'll read. I've changed it since, but I'll read this draft because I can find it. Brilliant. Um, okay, it's called um, Reunion 2. Um, winter has left its scrapings on prospects. The field injects its corn. I do not know, but I have faith in Persephone as Demeter waits in my grandmother's chair. Bone mother came to the shed, grated her knuckles on my door. Dirt is now a flavor, bread seasoned with ground bone. Compacted one can walk on salt. Compacted one can walk on earth compacted we walk on bones. I found a teapot handle, dolphin shaped on the shore, a gift from the sea mother, though bone came first to my door. 
Perhaps it is an oracle through which each mother listens, blue, crazed brown and notched like bone. I will sit down with Persephone, chew Demetra's cakes of corn, the slow baked bread of ancestry. Bone mother will bring scones. Good. <laughs> Well, we had a full house for reading tonight. Uh, that's great. Uh, reading, we had we had Therese, Catherine, Moira, Ada, Margaret, Susan, Janet, Mags, Lauren, Moza, Ruth, Mona, and Amanda. Basically, everyone who was here. So, <laughs> great. Full points. Um, that's fantastic. That, that, that is a, a wonderful night uh, so much so my brain is completely dead and I have clean forgotten if we have any other announcements uh, Moza maybe you can uh, help me out <laughs> okay I will help you out uh, the next uh, session will be on the 16th of June uh, Bloomsday, Bloomsday but we're not going to do anything <laughs> about Bloomsday uh, we're going to have um, Andrea Carter who is a lawyer and a uh, actually a best-selling uh, crime writer and um, you know we're going to um, talk to her and I, I've just uh, ordered a book in the library which was written by her so I have at least one book read by her if anyone else wants to do the same <laughs> because I, I, I was told that uh, by Stan who organized this as well that um, she likes to be asked questions so you know we can ask her questions and um, that's yeah, 16th of June, 8.30. And uh, we have to uh, gratefully thank the Cork County Council Arts Office because they're giving us a grant again. Thank you. And thank you everyone who was here. And thank you, Molly. And thank you, Lauren and Stan and everyone. And our mother in the sky, Demeter, and our <laughs> sister in in the soil pros Persephone okay I can never pronounce it properly thank you very much and that was it for now it's a very long recording